Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Music Industry City Future Music Forum digital session. Uh, today, we have a great talk for you. It's Music Sync. Everybody loves Sync. And uh, so it's going to be a great conversation. I see a lot of people in the chat. Hi, welcome. I see a lot of people. I see from, from Barcelona. I see Oh, people are saying hi to Julie. So when Julie comes on stage, look at this. All right. So, yeah, let us know where you're all from. Uh, I'm really excited that we have a great crew of people like this. These people really know what goes on the day to day, what's behind the scenes and is going to offer a lot of valuable information. Um, it's all part of the New York Music Month warm up series. We're going to be doing these monthly. So this is the first one. So welcome. You are all first. And we'll be doing one next month on uh, diversity, inclusion and business practices. And then on the, in May, we will be doing another one about collecting revenue streams and managing your career. This is all leading up to the June is New York Music Month series, which has the flagship New York Music Month conference on June 7th and a lot of events going on throughout the month. But to talk about this more, I'd like to introduce Shira Gans from the mayor's office. Shira, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm excited to be here today for our first of the warm-up series. My name is Shira Gans. I'm from the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. For those of you who aren't familiar with our office, we are the city agency that supports all the creative sectors in New York. So that's 500,000 jobs and 150 billion in economic output. Um, that's something we take really seriously here. It's big business for the city and it's also a huge part of our identity. In my role, uh, I drive partnerships and programs to support the music industry. And one of those initiatives that I created to do that is New York Music Month. So that happens every June and it involves a ton of free resources, concerts, activities for either if you're an artist, if you're in the business, we have something for you. Um, so this year we're really adding a lot more to the lineup and as we get closer we'll be announcing some of those things as peter mentioned this warm-up series is one of those so i'm excited for today's discussion um, i'm excited for all the amazing speakers that we have and just want to thank both the speakers and peter without whom i could never do new york music month so enjoy the discussion and i hope to see you in june Thank you, Cher. And we're, we're so honored to be part of like, you know, the support. And there's so much more events going on that the mayor's office is supporting. Are there any that I know for the past few years, especially during the pandemic, we had the, you know, the digital series and then coming yeah. back was like a hybrid series. Uh, yeah. Is there anything you're really looking forward to coming this June? Yeah, so, you know, one cool part is we've always underwritten rehearsal space for musicians, and we've done that mostly in Brooklyn. So this year we'll be announcing our partners, but we're going to have free rehearsal space in all five boroughs. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, we're going to be diversifying the content where we're going to be bringing some podcast action into the mix. So we'll be doing um, some live taping of podcasting. We'll be touching on some new topics like what immigrants mean and contribute to New York City's music um, ecosystem and and lots more. So yeah, I'm excited. Awesome. Looking forward to it. And everybody give a round of applause for, uh, for Shira. I mean, the, the, what she does uh, out of the mayor's office f to support the music industry here in New York City is absolutely fantastic. So thank you for everything that you do. Oh, thanks. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, without further ado, let's get to the, to the good part of the topic here. Sync. And we love sync. Everybody loves sync. Josh, let's bring Josh up to the stage. Josh, Josh, you know a thing or two about sync. I know a few things about sync for sure. <laughs> <laughs> give us a little, give us a quick background. When when did you like you're you're from the advertising side? Give us a quick background. Yeah, I was the head of music at Gray Advertising, a big global advertising conglomerate for 14 years. I left there to start uh, my own consultancy called Brooklyn Music Experience, which does a lot of music supervision. I do a lot of music production. I'm also a music professor, but I've been in the space for about 25 years. And we picked out an excellent panel of experts that have different perspectives um, about the field and space known as sync, which is short for synchronization. And as many of you know, and some of you don't, synchronization or sync essentially means taking a piece of film and synchronizing it with a piece of music. And the synchronization license is actually a publishing license that's used. And that's where the word sync came from. That's, uh, that's wonderful. And it's like the old sync was actually the old with the reels and the cogs and like lining them up and cutting tape and film. And that's where you were synchronizing the two, the audio tape and the film. Yeah. So, 
we used to use razor blades and, yep. and the like. <laughs> I remember those days. Uh, Josh, great to have you. Well, uh, without further ado, let's bring up our special guest for today. And for everybody in the audience, uh, it's, it's not, it's not going to be like a and a panel, like, you know, just like another talking head. It's going to be more of a conversation. So if there is something that you're hearing somebody talk about a particular topic, you want to find out more, you know, just, uh, ask a comment, you know, put something in the chat and we're going to be able to see that and hopefully maybe be able to pick it up and part of the conversation. So we really encourage everybody to, you know, and if, uh, if there's something that's really cool, you know, put in an applause emoji, thumbs up, things like that. And, uh, so I'm going to let everybody take it away here. So, so, Josh, everybody else? Hey, hey, we're, we're so glad to have this amazing crew of people. Um, I thought it would be great if each of you can introduce yourself and speak a bit about how you're connected to synchronization and music licensing. And um, Julie, why don't you go first? You're on to my right corner. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Julie Hurwitz. I'm the president of Global Sync at Hip Hypnosis Songs Management. Um, I've been in this space for a very long time. Like Josh, we've known each other for a really long time. Thank you again, Josh, for bringing me in here. Um, I have focused most of my career on placing music into ads um, and relationships between artists and brands and negotiating those deals. Um, I've worked on many Super Bowl commercials. I've worked on global you know, advertising campaigns, makeup campaigns. I saw someone is here from Paris. There's amazing, obviously amazing fashion uh, commercials that come out of there. So uh, kind of everything in between. And it's mm -hmm. been really fun. And how long have you been at your present position? Um, I've been here only about 10 months. Um, mm -hmm. Hypnosis is a relatively new company. Um, I was at a publisher before this called Cobalt for more than 10 years. And Hypnosis was actually my client. Um, so I'm now client side and um, hypnosis is an interesting, I'm sure we'll get into this. Um, I don't mean to monopolize the conversation already, but hypnosis is a relatively, uh, is a newcomer in a relatively new kind of business model within the music space where we purchase iconic song catalogs and then own them and do what we can to monetize them and uh, consider them sort of a, as an investment and an asset class. And so my, my job and my team's job mm -hmm. is to add value to those catalogs wherever we can. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. It's so great to have you and see you and hang out. Uh, Womack, why don't you introduce yourself and tell people about what you're up to? Sure thing. Uh, how's it going, everybody? Uh, my name's Adrian Womack. I go by my last name, Womack. I'm um, happy to be here. Thank you, uh, Josh and Pete, for, for bringing me on. Uh, I'm a creative producer at a music production company uh, called Racket Club. Um, like Hypnosis, we're relatively newer. And uh, essentially what we do is that we work and partner with ad agencies and brands to um, help them solve musical solutions. Um, our bread and butter is creating bespoke music, but we also are often working with partners um, out in the sync world, like a hypnosis, like a cobalt and other com similar companies uh, to music supervise. And, you know, and uh, within our own catalog of music, we've amassed a, a, a large library of tracks um, from uh, our in-house writers and music writers uh, from all over um, to then, you know, help get those pieces of music that people have written placed. Um, we also dabble in uh, audio post, uh, doing uh, audio engineering mix sound design, video casting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as a creative producer, um, you know, I think a lot of people have the traditional idea when they hear music producer, uh, that it's somebody that's in the weeds of everything, that's making the beats behind and doing everything behind the music. Uh, but in the advertising world, usually producer actually means a sort of a project manager with a specialty. And so my specialty happens to be music in terms of helping to manage the jobs working with the writers that we work with to make sure that they're crafting something that is, you know, uh, tasteful, sounds great, and but is ultimately what our clients are looking for. Um, we work with a bunch of awesome, fun brands, everything from uh, Volvo to Publix, um, you list it, you name it, and we, you know, we've had the, the fortune and the fun working on these types of these projects. That's great. And I think it's really great that uh, you work with a company that does create customized original slash bespoke music 
Uh, a lot of people don't realize that in the media landscape with synchronization happens, there's a lot of deals that are done with uh, original music created specifically for that. And I, I know that my career started in that space and Julie's did as well. So it's it's phenomenal to connect uh, with someone who's in that space too. So it's, it's really good to have you here. Uh, thanks for being here. And then Brooke, talk to us about what you're up to. You're up to a lot of crazy stuff. <laughs> yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brooke Fremont. I am the EVP of uh, SYNC at Concord Music Publishing. Um, Concord is one of the largest independent, still independent uh, music publishing companies out there. We also have a record label side, a theatrical side, as well as film and TV originals. Um, but so what my main role is at Concord is running the sync department within the publishing division. Um, so we're the ones, our team is about 15 people um, that are actively trying to find opportunities for our catalog in across all media. So ads, TV, trailers, films, video games, podcasts, promos, all, all of that stuff. Um, uh, you know, some of the catalogs that we represent are Cindy Lauper, uh, Phil Collins, Yola, Allison Russell, Glenn Ballard, Ruel, Omar Apollo. So it really stretches the gamut between, you know, emerging writers that are just starting out in their career that we really feel like we can work well in this in this area. Um, you know, to Rogers and Hammerstein catalog and, and bigger catalogs that we really just try to figure out ways to market um, and work with music supervisors across all media to try to figure out and anticipate their needs. Um, you know, whether it's them coming to us that they need a particular song for a project that they're working on for a particular scene, they send us, you know, requests like that, as well as just sort of like figuring out what shows are happening in the marketplace, um, what themes are working well in the sync area and trying to get the music that they could use uh, within their projects. And it's a very competitive market. Um, we are, you know, super proactive about what we do, trying to really, um, you know, get in in the inboxes of a lot of these music supervisors and, and try to make sure that our songwriters are represented when pitching and you know we work very closely with our songwriters to try to get them to understand this marketplace if it's something that's of interest to them so we will work with them in terms of um having them understand what works in the in this world um you know and of course we we pitch their music but we do do a lot of bespoke stuff as well with them where it's like hey can you write us a, a song you know more syncable maybe about female empowerment or some sort of themes that come up a lot in this area. So it's super fun and rewarding and, and you know, I love it. Yeah, it's great. It's great that you shared that insight because a lot of people might think of as pu publishers as just representing catalogs, not interacting with the songwriters that much, not being super creative all the time, but that's not the case at all. Creativity is king and queen in this process and in synchronization, that's really what it's all about. So I guess like the first topic that I thought we could cover is kind of like the process a little bit, how it all goes down. You know, there's certainly somebody reaches out to a publisher or to a music supervisor asking for a, a particular song or giving a brief or things like that. Like, how would you, Julie, kind of speak to the process generally about kind of how it goes down, who some of your collaborators are, maybe some of like the, the fundamentals of negotiating, whatever you feel yeah. like is appropriate to share. Um, well, first of all, I just, I'm not sure if everyone even understands what the difference between a publisher is and a label. If mm. you do forgive me, it's pretty, it's like a very first, you know, basic part of the music industry, but, um, a publishing company represents the songwriter and the record label represents the performer. Mm. And oftentimes the performer is also the songwriter, but oftentimes they are not. So for example, um, I used to work at Cobalt with this very successful songwriter called Max Martin. He has co he has written or co-written, I don't know, like 50 top 40 hits in the past 10 years. There's actually a, a play on Broadway using all of his m music right now called Anne Juliet. Um, but he's not a performer. So, you know, whereas let's say, for example, Pearl Jam is a band, they're a performer. They also write all their stuff. So just to sort of make that distinction there. Um, 
I also, like Josh said, I worked at an ad agency beforehand called Ogilvy. So I can tell you from the Ogilvy point of view is kind of where it starts, or sorry, from the ad agency point of view is kind of where it starts, where you have a, he is a total legend. Thanks, Cass. Um, uh, and so an agency client, let's say Volvo, um, wants to do a new ad. They have a new electronic vehicle. There's a whole process within an ad, ad agency. There's testing and there's surveying and all sorts of stuff to come up with whatever, with whatever the creative concept is. And then from there, um, the agency comes up with the what they need for the music. Sometimes music comes into play really early on in the process, which is what we all prefer, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> sometimes it comes in the very last minute, which is which I hate. But um, so then the agency will call and they'll say, hey, we have a new Volvo commercial. We're looking for songs about sunshine uh, with a female vocal. Do you have anything? And my team and I will comb through the library and come up with ideas. And, you know, Brooke will do the same thing. Womack's doing the same thing. Josh's doing the same thing. So we're all basically competing against each other. But it, um, they, I think it's safe to say we all kind of just are big music fans and, you um, there's enough business to go around, luckily. But so, you know, so we'll pitch songs and um, and then someone may find something that they like. Hey, um, this B-52 song could work great. How much do you think it will cost? Um, and then we go into the whole process of where is it going to run and for how long? Um, is it going to be online? Will there, where, will there be paid media behind that? Um, is it going to run X US or only in the US? And then you kind of put all these categories together into a cocktail and you mix it up and you kind of come up with a number. Um, <laughs> Josh and I spoke about this earlier. Um, you know, you come up with a number that is pretty much based on nothing. Like it's pulled out of thin air <laughs> and you're trying to figure out how badly does the client want it and how many other songs have they asked about? And if they've asked about more songs, then you kind of, you know, you should price it a bit more competitively. If they only want your one song and it's the only song that will work, um, you can kind of get the price <laughs> a bit higher. Nice. I have a funny story about that actually. So you know, when when we get a request in for a particular song for a project, we'll try to dig with the with the requester and ask them, you know, more details. And sometimes one person in the same day literally said to me, I'm so sorry, we have no money. We have, you know, only 50 grand. And then later that same day, I'm like, we have no money, we have no money, you know, $500. And I'm like, the difference between what people call no money is so bad. That you really, you know, you just need to come up with what you think is the value of the song because it could really run. I see Cass has an interesting question. Um, do you guys think stream numbers count for syncability? Yeah. No. Well, what do you think? Well, you know, I think stream numbers do kind of, you know, factor in, you know, for um, songs being written by popular artists and artists who have like a bit of cachet uh, which is what, you know, uh, folks like Julie in their catalog and, you know, Hypnosis's catalog is going to be dealing with. Um, and, and, you know, the main difference between sort of where we operate uh, at Racket Club, where we're a music house, we're working with independent artists who, in many cases, you just haven't heard of a lot of these people, even though they're like some of the most talented music writers who are out there in the game. Um, their specialty is creating music that is just you know, meant to be built around the commercial. And so because they don't have the sort of like same artist cachet that's going to, you know, attract uh, people like Honey in the same way that like a Dua Lipa or a Taylor Swift or somebody like that does, you know, that's kind of why we are operating in a lot of cases on a lower price point in terms of what we're going to be working with uh, for Sinks. Um, although, you know, my role and the, the, the role of my organization is to you know make sure that there is a fair and a competitive price that's being doled out between what's being uh, received from the client and the ad agency and what's uh, what you know what we're doling out to our writers. Um, speaking of which, somebody brought up a great uh, a great question about like what are the rights for composers who are hired to write bespoke music? Um, is it 
you know, is there, do we get to keep the publishing and the writing shares and things like that? Or is it all work for hire? You know, I think there's a lot of entities that are out there that um, serve different functions and terms might seem similar. It might seem like, you know, they're serving the same type of work, but, you know, with client budgets being all over the place in the way that um, uh, everyone here suggested, it's kind of like, you've got to figure out the solutions that make the most sense for you um, as a music house. And if you're a writer, you have to kind of just gauge for yourself, you know, where am I in my artistry? Where am I at the level of um, the type of, and the quality of music that I'm writing and the type of reach that it has? Um, and am I at a state in my career in terms of, and my network <clears throat> where I have a harder time, maybe, you know, being in contact and getting regular work, then, you know, you might sometimes have to like bite the bullet and sell off some of your work, work for hire to some of these agencies that have, and these organizations that uh, are placing music uh, at lower price points. But as you start to catch a rhythm and get into a rhythm with your career and you start to build up your portfolio and your library, you might, you know, reach a point where you're working uh, with a company like myself and others like us that are, you know, um, able to negotiate higher rates for the work depending on the projects that, that come our way. Oh, that's great insight. I think it's really important um, for people to understand a bit about sync that, uh, or, or at least a, a nugget about sync is you are always aligning your music with an image, with a creative concept, with a piece of film, with a piece of TV. Um, and, and sometimes you have great music that lives on its own in an excellent place and people love it. You love it, your friends love it, your, your collaborators love it, but it might not work with synchronization. Um, it could be a great piece of music, then you put it to a picture, you put it to a concept, you pitch it to a concept that doesn't necessarily work. So, you know, that kind of symbiosis, that mutually beneficial aspect to it is really an important thing to think about. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of one of the driving forces in synchronization is that it is music for a picture, music for a concept, music for a visual image. And I know that um, there are a lot of emerging uh, artists out there, percolating talent, people that are on the underground on their way up. And I think it's great for us maybe to share a little bit of wisdom in terms of kind of some advice about the process and about how they can kind of connect in to this business. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any suggestions or thoughts or advice, I think that would be great. Well, I see Davida O has an interesting um, proposition about uh, representing African artists and getting into the US sync space. Um, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it, there's a long and short answer. I mean, we, there, it's a really great community. I have to say there's a tight community in LA. There's a very tight community here in New York. Um, many ad agencies have an in-house music producer. That would be one of my first stops, um, Davida, would just to, to find ad agencies with a music producer and just reach out to those folks. I mean, LinkedIn is, ama is an amazing resource, obviously. Um, I just met someone a couple of weeks ago who's new to the sync space and I invited them out and introduced them to a couple of other people. So, you know, I feel like once you kind of, um, I mean, at the risk of sort of saying this live, like I'd be happy to help you, especially with for African artists. That so, sounds so interesting. Um, and then just kind of, you know, you have to just constantly be reading the trades and updating your catalog and updating your database and, um, figuring out who's making decisions about music and, and ads and films. And, you know, you just have to kind of do the groundwork at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. I have uh, something to add to that. So, you know, as far as helping our songwriters um, learn how to, you know, write for sync or be more successful in the sync space, whenever we sign somebody new and, um, you know, they're just starting out and they're telling us that they want syncs, what I tell them to do first and foremost is watch TV. It sounds so silly, but <laughs> it's literally up. at your fingertips, the research. So if you sit on your couch on a Tuesday night from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. prime time, don't fast forward the commercials, just watch TV. In two hours time, you'll be able to see what's being used on ads, promos, movie trailers, 
uh, TV, obviously. Um, video game trailers will probably pop up. So you'll really be able to see what's being used in the marketplace and why is that song used. And every time I watch TV, I get inspired to have our songwriters write new songs and write song about this and come back to us with this. And it really goes a long way. And, and I have my team do that as well because it, it really shows what's trending, um, why the song works. And like to the question earlier about do, do we need, you know, a song to be uh, top level streaming to get synced, my gut is to say no. Sometimes a song could be the biggest song in the world and it won't get any syncs because it just doesn't have that syncability factor, which, you know, as someone in the sync department, I listen to music so differently than our A&R department. They come to me and they ask, you know, is this good? Uh, sometimes I'll be like, it's great, but it's not, we're not going to get one sync with it. So if you're going to offer a deal, just don't promise anything and just really, you know, have that in mind when you're figuring out in advance, that sort of thing. So, you know, that that's really important when it comes to um, sync factor. Yeah. yeah, Womack, what do you think about sync success? Like the, like a, the, the, the quality of the music being able to be synced? Oh, yeah, I couldn't agree more with what, you know, Brooke was saying. Um, you know, I, when I'm listening to music, the a lot of times I'm listening and I'm sort of parsing out in my mind, oh, is this a song that I, I'm able to listen to standalone, that it's just a good piece of music to just listen to? Or is this a piece of music that has, uh, it's a word I use a lot, and all my, you know, all my people in my organization probably are rolling their eyes if they're hearing me say this, but that has a certain dynamism, that has a certain, like, movement and changes and has a, you know, something um, for an editor to cut to. I think, you know, the, the, the biggest takeaway I think of what Brooke was saying is just about like watching television and watching things. And uh, the ultimate takeaway for, for me for that is to just be curious about what it is that's out there in the world and how it's being made and understanding that if it's out there in the world, there's a lot of people who are probably behind making those decisions and, you know, trying to figure out what those roles are, being curious enough to like go do the research about, you know, who are making those decisions and what it is that they're looking for, I think is one of the biggest things that a writer can do like outside of their creative, but in order to like influence their creative, I think the biggest thing that they can do is, you know, just do everything you can to make your, make your music feel picturesque, if you will. Nice. Can I add to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah I totally agree. Just to just to sort of add on to it. Um, I think, first of all, what Brooke, what you were saying about watching TV, I mean, it's like so obvious. I also find it really interesting that it depends on when you're watching TV. So like if you're watching TV during, um, you know, prime time, it's going to be um, it's going to appeal towards a certain demographic. If you're watching during right. like the NBA finals, it's going to be a certain vibe. If you're watching like daytime television, kids, Saturday morning TV, like it's all sort of, uh, it's all kind of different uh, right. vibes there. Um, the ones that are the most lucrative though are during prime time. So keep that in mind if you're a songwriter. And then um, also interesting is uh, depending on the media type, so in other words, advertising versus television versus film versus video game, um, different music, just to answer the sync, what is syncability? Um, Consuelo, you asked that. Um, syncability meaning uh, how likely is it going to be used to various picture? So for example, if you're looking to find something that's syncable for advertising, it tends to have to appeal to a, a wide audience. You know, it's not, it's not a, it's like the most accessible, um, not not too edgy, not too singer songwritery. It kind of has to be somewhere in the middle, and the lyrics shouldn't be too specific. Like you know, if I ever hear if I ever hear a great song, um, like I used to work with the Lumineers, and they wrote a song Ophelia, and I love that song, but I was like, darn it, because if it has oh, someone's name in it, it's going to be very difficult to sync it. Mm -hmm. um, and then in television. You know, there's a lot of heartbreak and romance and and that sort of stuff works in TV, but it doesn't work in advertising necessarily. 
Um, and the same goes for films. And then in video games, you know, you know, and it's it tends to need to be like sweeping and broad and anthemic and um, or for video game trailers, I should say. I mean, these are all general generalizations, but I do find it so interesting, like depending on when you're watching TV and what you're what media you're using, um, music tends to be different for each of those. No, that's really great intel and insight. And I think um, kind of analogous to that is understanding that there's a real process to it and each medium is different. So like mm -hmm. the gatekeepers are different. The points of contact right. are different. The approvers are different for different medium. Budgets are different. The budgets are different. Sometimes people argue that trailers and advertising pay overall in the aggregate more money. But, you know, sometimes advertising, like Brooke said, they might have $500 uh, for an ad. So it can be really complex. But I think the thing to really think about, and this is something maybe we should all talk about, is understanding who the gatekeepers and kind of the points of entry are. With advertising, there's certainly a lot of cooks in the kitchen. A lot of people are wanting to pee in that soup, if you will. Like, it's a crazy concept. And uh, it's gross, sorry. And, you know, it's certainly when you're talking about film, there aren't many, as many players, depending on the type of film. And in television, mm -hmm. there there is a music supervisor, there's a showrunner, maybe an executive producer, um, and a music editor. So, you know, why don't we speak to that process a little bit about approvals and who you guys get your approvals from also. Womack, why don't you jump in on that? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, Julie mentioned it a bit ago, but yeah, for, for us, a lot largely the process does start on the advertising agency side. So an agency like Ogilvy uh, and many others like it, uh, will they're the ones crafting all the crazy strategy and the crazy ideas to help a brand uh, or their clients um, serve their marketing goals. Um, but in a lot of cases, the ad agency does not themselves have the facilities in order to you know, actually produce, sh film, shoot, edit, and in our case, uh, craft the music for the ads they're creating. And so they work with partner companies like us and they come to us with a music brief um, that if they have music producers uh, or yeah, music supervisors on the ad agency side, a lot of times those brief are, you know, sort of make a lot of sense musically in, in a lot of cases where there aren't music producers. It's a lot of just, um, descriptions and understandings that uh, folks like myself have to then synthesize and make uh, a lot more usable for our writers. And from that standpoint and from that point, we take and synthesize that and then we get our in-house writers to start writing music. And we also will work with a lot of the independent writers that are in our roster that we think would be good for that particular brief, for that particular um, instruction for music crafting. Um, it'll be anywhere between like five to 10, 12 people that will end up having on a roster to craft music from their perspective based on the brief that we've synthesized for them. And then they send that music back to us for us to review internally, for then for us to share with the ad agency so that they can make selections of what is their favorites. And then from there, the ad agency will um, curate it even further to then present to the brand client to at some point uh, in what could be in the span of a week to several months, depending on the project, uh, a final decision ends up getting made and then a licensing deal ends up being arranged um, in order to license that piece of music. And so the biggest thing that I would say to writers understanding, at least from the advertising perspective, is that a big thing you have to sort of develop is a lot of thick skin and understanding that even though your work isn't being selected for this particular project, you're competing against other very talented people. And it is a very subjective process at the end of the day. And so the, the way to look at it is that you're writing a piece of music and if it doesn't get used, then you'll be able to keep it housed in your library in most cases and be able to pitch it uh, for a library search for a music supervision search down the line and down the road. And so, you know, I would say to just always look at these things as opportunities more than, um, losses ever in the situation. Sure. Hey, Brooke, what do you um, have insight-wise? 
Yeah, so that's such a good point. There are so many songs that we've pitched for, you know, for years and and then, you know, years later end up getting a request for. And so it's like, oh, yeah, I sent that out, you know, two years ago. Finally, you got a spot or we sent something for JCPenney and then two years later it gets picked up for a Target spot. Um, so that's that's always fun. The mm -hmm. other thing I was going to say specifically about um, different media and supervisors. Um, so I said we had about 15 people on our team and we break up our pitching specifically by media on purpose. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, we've got three people out of those that are pitching specifically to ads. So they're working with the ad agencies and the music supervisors and and um, that sort of thing to try to figure out what they need. And we have the same yeah. thing as we break it up by other media. So the trailer people are working closely with the people at the trailer houses to get them what they need and anticipate their needs. Um, you know, and it works really well that way for us because then you can really get to know um, the people within your media and like any any business area it's all about relationships so if we get them what they need if we're you know not annoying to them or we're you know fulfilling them and helping them with their jobs they could ideally keep coming back to us um you know and i always say it's a really hard business we probably pitch about two thousand things to get one thing that's how competitive it is out there, how much music you need to send out, but you need to be reliable, you need to be fast, you need to be, you know, um, on point. If a, if a music supervisor is sending you a request with a brief in it, it has to be upbeat, it has to be female vocals, and it has to be, um, you know, uh, lyrically about something very specific. You have to hit all three of those things when you send the songs. If you don't have anything, you don't send anything. You don't you know, because you're wasting their time, they're not going to come back to you. So that's a really important aspect of pitching. And the the one thing I'd also like to add to that, and it's all excellent points, is I think the other important quality I think a lot of uh, music writers tend to struggle with in a lot of cases is that, you know, they do want to be writing the best piece of music that they can be. Uh, but the other way, thing, uh, other way you have to think about it is that, you know, it's not necessarily when we're talking about sync and putting things in picture, it's not, the music is not always the most important thing in the situation. Yes, it's doing a lot to help contextualize what you should be feeling and setting the tone for what's happening. Um, but in a lot of cases, the action on screen, the, the talent on screen, the stories that are being told on screen are the thing that are the most important. And you would do yourself the most favor as a music writer is to keep that in mind as you're writing things and learn to build music that is great, but is also able to take a back seat to, um, and be a part of the entire course of what we're seeing and experiencing uh, within any type of film that we're uh, consuming. Oh, nice. Julie, what are your thoughts on the process a little bit and, and kind of your experiences? Um, I mean, it is very needle in a haystacky a lot of the time. Um, like Brooke said, I, I that's a pretty drastic stat you said 2000 i i would have i would have i mean i'm sure i mean 2000 songs right. going out you I, know. I got i got yeah. you. i i i used to say 50 pitches to get one sync landed so right. if you if you put about 20 songs in each pitch that's a thousand songs so it was sort of close um but uh you know the the process to answer a, 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 whole, a whole bunch of you in the chat have asked how you even sort of like get started um and in answer to your question, Chip, um, no, we do not open unsolicited material. Um, I think there's a whole host of reasons behind that legal. Otherwise, people think maybe you're ripping them off if they've sent something. And I don't know, it just gets it, it has potential to get really messy. So, you know, you have to get representation, a manager or an attorney or somebody who can help you kind of get in touch with the people who make those decisions. If you want to make it a business, if you want to make this a business, you have to line yourself up as a business. Um, but the process, sometimes it's a needle in the haystack and takes months, like Womack said, and sometimes somebody will know exactly what they want. A creative director will know, or a director and editor will know exactly what they want and they'll come straight to you and they'll say we have this much money and you'll you you'll be like great done and then it's on air you know it's it's kind of all over the place um it, it comes from all different directions i mean i used to say 
you know, the editor's girlfriend's dog walkers aunt doesn't mm -hmm. like a song that the CEO likes, so they're changing it now, or, you know, mm -hmm. or it does like a song, so they're choosing mm -hmm. that. I mean, it's kind of, it is really kind of very, very subjective. It's incredibly subjective. It's incredibly up and down. Sometimes you have a really great success rate. And what I would suggest to people that are interested in the space is to consider <clears throat> looking into some of the great work that they see that's been executed on television, you know, watching two hours of TV and commercials or film on Netflix or whatever, and, and try to do the research and figure out who are the people that executed that work. Maybe there's a sync agent involved. The sync agent is like a third party that manages uh, music rights from maybe from some catalogs, for some pub publishers, from some labels, or just independent artists. Um, maybe there was a music supervisor or a publisher or a music library that was kind of associated with it. Maybe there's a music supervisor from an ad agency. Maybe it's a music supervisor from a TV show or from a film. It, it, it could be a variety of different um, people that are involved. And you can usually research and figure that stuff out. Um, I, I highly recommend kind of that pursuit. It's, it's useful, it's educational, you know, and if you see something that works and you're passionate about it and you really like it, you think it's soulful, you think it's inspi inspiring, creative, unique, distinctive, go for it, learn about it, figure it all out. So, um, yeah, go on, go yeah. for it. And I think just one other point on top of that, you know, we've talked a lot about it, this world from, you know, in terms of supporting uh, music writers. But I think the other thing that shouldn't be discounted is, you know, the roles that we all have and the roles that we take uh, in this industry that, you know, uh, we're the gatekeepers and the, the, these roles are often gatekept, but they're all, they're out there and they're, av they're available. And you might be a great music writer, but you might also be an awesome music supervisor. So, you know, don't discount uh, this and having uh, proximity to uh, these creative spaces and these creative roles uh, that aren't exactly like necessarily getting their hands immediately dirty uh, with the creative. You know, it's awesome to be a music producer, a music supervisor, a sync supervisor. And I think we all appreciate our jobs. So um, definitely look into that. Maybe that will also help inspire your artistry outside of it. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to educate yourself and to really get yourself familiar with all the aspects of it. So we have a couple minutes left to mm -hmm. wrap it up. And uh, what we thought here is that uh, if each of you had like a, a, a succinct closing thought and maybe something that you wanted to speak about or promote that you're involved with that you think is really cool that's happening in culture. Although, Julie. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have started listening to a band that I didn't know about called Geese. So shout out to Geese. Um, they're a band from Brooklyn. I am obsessed with them. Um, and they are on the label called Partisan, and they have a new record coming out in June, but they just released a single. It's really fun. Mm. Um, so that's mine. Great. Brooke? Um, so many things. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> there is a new Allison Russell record coming out uh, in June, and she's stellar, amazing, and her last record did well. This one's going to blow it out of the water, and she signed to both publishing and, and label here. She's incredible, so check her out. Nice. Well, not. Um, well, to the writers out there, I'd say, you know, just be open and be curious to not just the music, but to all facets of this process, because it is, you know, and the same as it's about making music, it's about uh, the process as a whole and understanding it as best you can to give yourself the best footing. Uh, but in terms of things that promote, I'm also a part of an organization called AMP, which is the Association of Music producers, you can find us on ampnow, A-M-P-N-O-W.com. Uh, and we are putting on an awesome program to help uh, Black youth uh, within New York and LA for now uh, to get a footing in our side of the world. Um, it's a scholarship program that we have started up and the application just recently went live a few days ago. And so anybody who has a students emerging from high school who are curious about uh, this industry and what's available and out there for it, I uh, definitely encourage you to visit ampnow.com, uh, amp uh, navigate your way through the DNI uh, section of the page and encourage a young person to apply that might be able to benefit from what we've got going on. Well, that's great. And, Amazing. Yeah. And Very cool. They've raised a lot of money uh, recently in a recent execution uh, initiative. Uh, 
I saw something about it South by Southwest, and I know Womack, you were DJing at that event. It was awesome. Uh, I would say for people to look into AMP, it's a great organization. Uh, we do, uh, I'm part of it, we do uh, an award show. This is the 10th year, I believe, for the AMP Awards. Wow. Uh, I was the original curator uh, and chair of the first one 10 years ago. Feels like yesterday. There's also the Guild of Music Supervisors, a great team that educates and mentors people and does an award show. They're over 10 years now in their award show. Some great music supervision insight there. And a self-plug, you know, I'm a music professor at some universities and I do some career coaching also. I like to help aspiring minds and emerging talent. BrooklynMusicExperience.com is my site. And, you know, I think we're all really interested in helping people and we're reachable. I'm speaking for everyone. Uh, hopefully everyone agrees. You know, we, we have very busy schedules and uh, we love to connect with new people and network, all of us. So, you know, we're, we're really enthused to do this and uh, we're really enthused about what's going on um, with Shira and the city and Peter. And thank you so much, guys. For Thank you, guys. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Th this was fantastic. And as a person, I mean, Julie, I, I was at Cobalt years ago. I think I left just before, uh, I think it was like a month. We just missed each other by a month. And we worked on Michelle Stoddard's team, uh, the Queen Bee of Sync at the time. It was like, you know, when if you needed something synced, she was taking care of it and learned so much from her. And, these, and I hope everybody that uh, joined us, thank you all for joining us uh, first and foremost. And, you know, there's so much information. Thank you, everybody here for sharing. And thank you to the mayor's office and Shira for supporting this and everything with New York Music Month. And Shira, any, uh, you want to say final thoughts? Um, I'm just really excited to have learned much about sync. I also feel like it's exciting to know that watching two hours of TV on a Tuesday night is something you can feel like is professionally motivated. So I'm going to think about maybe a career shift myself. Um, no, but seriously, thank you guys. And for me, uh, being in the mayor's office of New York, it's really exciting to see folks from all over the globe. So that's a testament, I think, to our speakers and to Peter and hopefully to the draw that New York Music Month has and the fact that a lot of our events are virtual. You know, that wasn't the case before the pandemic. And we, we've kept that in because I think this is a global community. New York's a global city. And that's what makes it so special, all the different kinds of people and all the different kinds of sounds. So I'm glad to see that we're reaching beyond the five boroughs. And I'm excited to see you guys next month at our next warm up series. Right on. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, check out more at musicindustrycity.com and nymusicmonth.nyc. We're going to be doing another one of these next month and the following month. So uh, keep in touch and hope to see you soon. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Bye. day. Thank you, Peter.